Manitoba man charged with the first-degree murder deaths of his family. Absentee landlord sits on 20 empty properties in St. Stephen, New Brunswick amid housing crisis. Ontario to repeal wage cap law after appeal court rules Bill 124 unconstitutional. Student debt defaults nearly reach $3 billion. Auditor General's Arrive Can report finds glaring disregard for basic management practices and constitutional wrangling and vote challenges and protests are the aftermath of Pakistan's election. Good morning. It's Tuesday, February 13th. I'm Nora, and here are your headlines. We start this morning with an update on a story I brought you yesterday. A man has now been charged with five counts of first-degree murder in the deaths of his common-law partner, their three young children, and the niece of his partner, whose bodies were found in southern Manitoba on Sunday. Caitlin Gorlick from CBC writes that Ryan Howard Manoa Kisik, who's 29, of Carmen, Manitoba, was identified by RCMP as the man accused in the deaths at a news conference yesterday. All five victims and the accused lived together in the community of Carmen, 75 kilometers southwest of Winnipeg. Gorlick explains that the deceased woman's mother identified the body as her daughter, Amanda Clearwater. The children killed were her grandchildren, six-year-old Bethany, four-year-old Javen, and -and two-and-a-half-month-old Isabella. The niece was 17-year-old Maya Gratton. The victims' bodies were found in three separate locations in southern Manitoba on Sunday. While initial police reports said that a witness helped pull the three young children from a burning vehicle on Sunday, the RCMP now say that information was not accurate. They believe the accused removed his children from the vehicle himself. CBC doesn't mention the accused's history, but Chris Kitching and Dean Pritchard at the Winnipeg Free Press give some information. They write that Manoa Kisik had a history of crystal meth use, criminality, including impaired driving, and suffered from psychosis. They also report that he had lost his job as a pipe manufacturer. We hear cases of fathers killing their own children and partners all too often. And could these killings been avoided if Manoa Kisik had been given access to right mental health supports and other social services? We'll never know for sure, of course, but what's pretty obvious is that as a society, we need to do more to help those in crisis and addiction. We also need to do more to help women so that they can get away from dangerous partners. Next, to St. Stephen, New Brunswick, where amid a housing crisis, one Calgary-based landlord has 20 properties sitting empty since she bought them three years ago. St. Stephen only has 4,600 people living in it. And imagine 20 units sitting empty in a town of 4,600 with a housing crisis. You can imagine people are not very happy. CBC's Sam Farley reports that the landlord is Annette Pencala. She owns something called Starshine Properties and paid more than $2.4 million for them. Three of her buildings, which have a total of 20 units among them, are vacant and have become places where tenants and squatters have been recently kicked out, quote, under a special law targeting drug activity, unquote, which is uh, an interesting little detail that the province has. If someone is squatting in an empty property, they should absolutely be allowed to stay. But cops have been called to the properties a lot. In just two years, they say they've gotten some 140 calls to one of Pincala's properties. Anyway, of her other properties, the neighbors also say that they've never been quote unquote fully rented. CBC tried to get a hold of Pencala, including knocking on her door in Calgary, but have failed. Her corporate address leads to Edmonton to a company that gives small businesses an address to use if they need one which is like, uh, what? (laughs) That exists? Okay. Two local Starshine employees didn't respond to requests for comment either. The municipality said that they can't force Pencala to fix up her properties because the province wouldn't allow it. Photos in the story show the state of the residences are derelict, and Farley talked to one neighbor who is a carpenter and said that the place is, quote, beyond renting to anyone and beyond fixing. I wouldn't even put a freaking rat in them, unquote. That comes from Tim McGinley. He's also tried to have the fire marshal intervene, though they have also not. 521 households are waiting for affordable housing in St. Stephen. This story is a really good illustration of how the housing crisis gets fueled by bad public policy and bad decisions. The Municipal Council could probably do something a little out of the ordinary. They probably could put a motion in to seize ownership of the property from this landlord. Maybe that's not worth it. 
maybe there's something else they could do. But the supremacy of land ownership in this country and of landlords, even if they are acting in the exact opposite of the best interest of the community, you know, it supersedes all else. It's the most important thing. And as people in St. Stephen struggle for a place to live and they walk by these houses that are just falling derelict and will soon become so derelict that they'll have to be torn down, the clash between the need for housing and the need for someone apparently to be able to make profit, you know, the contradictions that that creates are here on full display. Next to Ontario, the province will repeal a wage cap law on public sector workers that the Court of Appeal found unconstitutional yesterday. Liam Casey and Allison Jones from the Canadian Press report that the law from Premier Doug Ford's government, known as Bill 124, capped salary increases for public sector workers at 1% a year for three years. A lower court struck it down as unconstitutional, and the appeal court, in a two-to-one decision, largely upheld that decision, writing that the infringement couldn't be justified. The court wrote, in its majority opinion, that because of the act, quote, organized public sector workers, many of whom are women, racialized and or low income earners, have lost the ability to negotiate for better compensation or even better work conditions that do not have a monetary value, unquote. The Conservatives enacted the law in 2019 under the guise of eliminating the deficit. The province argued the law did not infringe on constitutional rights, saying that the Charter only protects the process of bargaining, not the outcome, even though the wage freeze was not actually an outcome of bargaining, but whatever. The law had sparked widespread outrage. The law had sparked widespread outrage among labour groups and opposition parties, with its effects on the health sector as a particular focus. Critics argued it was partly responsible for driving nurses out of the profession or into private nursing agency where the pay is substantially higher for the same work. The Ontario Nurses Association provincial president, Aaron Aris, is quoted in the story saying this, quote, this sham of a bill has severely impacted access to and quality of care for Ontarians since 2019. The trauma inflicted on nurses and healthcare professionals because of Bill 124 has driven tens of thousands of us out of the healthcare system and away from the work that we love, unquote. Paul Cavaluzzo, who is a lawyer representing the Ontario English Catholic Teachers Association, said that the government's financial records were its own undoing. Quote, certainly the government's books now show that this legislation was not necessary. We were in a surplus situation. They were not even spending all of the budget money on health and education. The bill was unnecessary. Unquote. Next, student debt defaults in Canada have almost reached $3 billion. If a student cannot pay off their student loan or they manage to evade collectors for seven years, their debt is written off. As tuition fees have ballooned, so too has student debt and, of course, so too have the defaults. Documents obtained from Blacklock's reporter show that there are 264,194 people who owe a total of $2.948 billion to the federal government that are currently in default. That, by the way, is about as much money as Bell made in profits last year alone, just to make sure we still have perspective here. Student debt write-offs are the biggest cost to federal student debt programs. And they're silly because student debt that is written off ends up just functioning like a grant, despite the pain that the individual has to go to to be able to default on their loan and not pay it back. It's expensive proof that the system feeds itself to sustain students in debt when it would actually be possible to eliminate this, eliminate the bureaucracy to track all of this, eliminate all of the local financial aid offices and grants and bursaries that universities chase and fundraising departments and so on and so on and so on, all in the service of feeding students more and more debt. Anyway, this has been a steadily growing problem for many, many years that student activists have been fighting against. In fact, I remember when we hit our first billion. Now to Canada's Auditor General, who has found that those involved in the contracting, developing and implementation of the controversial Arrive Can app showed a, quote, glaring disregard, unquote, for basic management practices. CTV's Rachel Aiello reports that the Auditor General, Karen Hogan, identified failures by Canada Border Services Agency, the Public Health Agency of Canada, and Public Services and Procurement Canada in connection to the Arrive Can app. According to the story, the report pegs the cost of the app at $59.5 million, more than previously estimated $54 million, but cautions that the true cost was impossible to calculate because of the border agency's, quote, poor financial record keeping, unquote. Hogan told the House Public Accounts Committee that while assessing the application, she came across the worst bookkeeping she's seen in years. 
She said, quote, I am deeply concerned by what this audit didn't find. We didn't find records to accurately show how much was spent on what, who did the work or how and why contracting decisions were made and that paper trails should have existed, unquote. NDP leader Jagmeet Singh called this procurement a debacle and is just the latest example of liberal mishandling, except he forgets that they're literally propping them up. Okay. And finally, Pakistanis have voted, and their choice has been, I guess, officially a bit of a surprise. The majority went to Imran Khan's party with 95 of 264 seats, despite Khan currently being in jail. Nawaz Sharif and the Pakistan Muslim League Nawaz came in with 75 seats. They are the party that has the backing of Pakistan's military. No party won a majority, and so parties are now in negotiations trying to secure a hold on power. In some ridings, candidates who are members of Khan's party refused to concede due to claims that there was vote tampering and other corrupt practices that stopped them from winning. In Lahore, protesters filled the streets and there were arrests. There were also protests in other parts of the country. Khan's party organized protests and a strike against the alleged corruption. The Pakistan People's Party, led by Bilalal Bhutto Zardari, won 54 seats. Those are your headlines for Tuesday, February 12th. I'm Nora. You are listening to this podcast at sandynora.com on the Real News Network podcast feed and anywhere you get your podcasts. Production assistance from Mary Newman this morning. It's Tuesday, which means it's Sandy and Nora Day. New episodes coming up in a bit. We rant about the media. You will not want to miss it. So watch your podcast catcher in the next couple of hours and uh, the episode will be there right in time for your lunch.